<clears throat> good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting to order on June 25th, 2024, and I'll ask our city clerk to please call roll. Commissioner Guest? Present. Commissioner Henderson? Present. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Wilson? Present. Mayor Bray? Here. And I would ask uh, Commissioner Wilson to say the invocation and then ask everyone to remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you on behalf of all of us who are gathered here today for the many blessings that we have. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work. Please be with us today and grant us wisdom as we make decisions on behalf of our citizens. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Manager, are there, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Mayor, none this evening. All right, so I'll uh, ask uh, uh, Michelle Smolin and, uh, to come up and introduce one of our, our, our newest employee. <laughs> well, good evening, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager, and City Clerk. I'm glad to formally introduce uh, Carol Galt as our Interim Planning Director. Although she is well known throughout the community and well respected, we thought it was important to bring her um, in front of you all at a commission meeting. So maybe those that have not met her in the community met um, uh, that have not met her in the community yet know who she is and know that they're welcome to reach out to her with a very important role that the planning department plays in the community. So Carol's currently serving as our interim planning director. Um, she'll be here for six months, which is essentially through the end of the year. She brings a wealth of knowledge and unique perspective. We were talking about this earlier with all the roles that she's played throughout the community um, and how she's inter interfaced with the planning department. So that includes a former city commissioner, <coughs> Main Street director, a business owner, and of course a large scale event organizer, just to name a few. <laughs> so she's already hit the ground running in providing leadership over, to that, over that department and we're grateful to have her. I'll turn it over to Carol. Thank you all, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I have hit the ground running. It's It's <laughs> been fun so far, and uh, I told some of the department heads that I probably owed them an apology, because um, seeing, it from, <laughs> seeing it from a different perspective, I have a, a new appreciation <laughs> for that. <laughs> I have a complete new appreciation for it, but um, I, I want to make sure everyone knows in the community as well that I have an open door policy. My cell number is published. You can find it almost anywhere, and please call if you have any question whatsoever, and if there's anything we can do for you, please reach out. Thanks, Thank Carol. Sure. Yeah, it's a great addition, um, great addition to, to the staff. Um, and uh, I think you are getting a good dose of uh, how busy our directors stay. Those, all of our directors work very hard. Those are very, very important jobs and busy jobs. So it's great to have your experience here and uh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we've got a presentation uh, from Jason Peterson, um, who manages uh, Paducah Water. Uh, welcome, Jason. Appreciate you uh, coming and letting us know everything that's going on with um, with this utility. Thank you very much, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, we're going to talk a high-level overview about uh, Paducah Water, kind of a year-end review. We're going to talk about a little bit of background, just make sure that everybody has a, a basic understanding of some of the history of Paducah Water. We're going to look at revenue and expenditures for the last fiscal year, which is 23-24. Talk a little bit about debt and some trends that we're seeing and some challenges ahead. And uh, if there are any questions, please stop me. This should take about 15 minutes and just please uh, interrupt me with any questions you might have or comments. So in 1885, Paducah Water was formed privately by a group of investors from Washington, DC. And in 1930, the city of Paducah actually purchased the entire water system for the, the tidy sum of $2 million, <clears throat> which is converted to about $37 million in today's dollars. The 
Paducah Water Works is governed by an independent board uh, the, of seven board members that are appointed by the mayor, four of which reside in the city, three of which reside in the county, and there is one ex officio, uh, Commissioner Smith serves on our board. The, the current system that we have is actually comprised of seven, or excuse me, eight smaller water systems, seven of which have joined the original city of Paducah system from 1930. And uh, the most recently in, in 2020. So big picture geographically, I don't have a map, but think Cavill to the west, Possum Trot to the east, and Melbourne to the south, and that'll give you an idea about the service area. The vast majority of McCracken County, the northern part of a uh, portion of Mayfield, or excuse me, Graves, and western Marshall counties. By the numbers, we've got six, 56 employees <clears throat> and almost 30,000 customers, and those are active individual meters. We serve about 65,000 people. Total, there's about 700 miles of water main that ranges up to 30 inches in diameter. And we maintain 4,700 hydrants and over 10,000 valves, some of which date back to 1886. So that's a lot of buried mechanical infrastructure and miles of pipe that we're, we're tasked with maintaining, and a good portion of which uh, has been installed and maintained by other water systems with varying degrees of methods of construction or documentation, et cetera. Looking at fiscal year revenue, <clears throat> I wanted to first point out that sometimes there's a misconception from some of our customers, and we hear things like, I pay taxes, or this is part of my taxes. But Paducah Water has its own independent revenue that's 100% based on rates, fees, or most recently, interest income. There's no tax monies that come into the budget for Paducah Water. And it, our fisc budget for fiscal year 23-24 is a little over $16 million, and about 70% of that comes from metered water. That's water that flows through a meter for which there's an active account and a bill is, is sent. We have a dedicated revenue stream for capital expansion that generates about $3.2 million. And that's a replacement fee for us to reinvest. That's a dedicated fixed sum uh, that's earmarked for reinvestment, continued reinvestment within the system. And then miscellaneous fees and, and other revenue are a smaller portion. Looking at expenditures, you can see expenditures are allocated at 16.06 million. So we're intending on putting everything back into the ground or otherwise uh, we have a balanced budget. About 60% of our expenditures are associated with operating income and that's payroll, lights, insurance, et cetera. There's where the 3.21 million appears. That's the dedicated reinvestment back into our system. And uh, also just of note, we have a small amount of debt service, but there's a, a dedicated line item for tank maintenance. And that's part of the, the rates that were set up in 2018. It's very, very expensive to maintain and paint elevated storage tanks. So that's a, that's a fixed earmark that allows us to proactively put money into uh, their earmark to make sure that we have adequate funds for those very expensive tasks when they come up. And I'll just note here, we're close enough to the end of the fiscal year that it looks like revenue is going to be about 3% above what was budgeted, and that's mostly due to the, the high sale of water in last summer. We're significantly affected by weather events, droughts, rainfall, etc. So this year it does look like we're going to come in slightly above the projected revenue. That was because uh, there was a drought last year and people had to water their lawns, lawns more? Or? That's right. We have a budget. Each year we budget an amount of water to be metered. And during a drought condition, there's a, there's a lot more water that's metered and we pump a lot more water than was budgeted. And that's tra that translates into excess revenue than was budgeted. From a debt standpoint, John touched on this. Uh, he said traditionally that sewer is a much more debt-oriented utility. Uh, Traditionally, Paducah Water has a they're relatively low debt load. We have two projects. The, in 1999, we extended a project to remove the water treatment plant in Reedland through an extension of a, a pump station and, and, a, and a large transmission line. The 24-inch transmission main, you may remember, that's recent memory. That's where we ran a 24-inch main to the Paducah Police Department there on Kentucky Avenue for some redundancy. And during that last fiscal year, there was a small debt load that came with West McCracken of 60000 That was actually paid off this year, so that will go away. So we'll be looking at about $4.3 million of debt service. And the years to the right is when those debts will come due or when the debt service drops off. 
Talking about growth, this chart shows number of active services from about 2011 to current. You can see that there were two mergers, one was with Hendron Water and the second was with West McCracken. Both of those consecutive systems purchased water from Paducah Water. So when you look at the, the volume of water pumped, it always has included those two systems. But when you look at active meters of Paducah Water customers, you can see an increase in 2013 and 22. But if you look between those mergers, you can see that we're on, on a fairly steady growth of about 0.7% active service increase per year. And it's pretty consistent during that time. The interesting thing is when you look at base load of metered water, and this is a, a metric that we use, we call it base metered water because it's from the, the each year from January to June. And those are generally the months that are less affected by summer drought, high heat, irrigation loads. That's the base consumption. And you can see that from all the way back to 2000 to recently, that's been a, on a relatively steady decrease at about 0.8% per year. The dashed line is just a linear trend line that represents that. And that's a trend that, that many, many utilities are seeing across the nation. It's still a pervasive, uh, every time you buy a dishwasher, it's more efficient than the last. The water conservation is taking many years to go into place, but that's the consensus that, that many utilities are coming to. Washing machines, dishwashers, low flow shower fixtures continue as people remodel and change out and new houses come online. And we're not sure to what degree that line is gonna to continue to, to, to decrease, but it's been a trend since 2000 and it it's, can be repeated across many utilities across the, the country. When you look at total metered water, you can see a trend. Our, some of our highest uh, pumping numbers were in the, 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 two, the 2000s. And since the 2000s, we've been in a relatively steady decline at about 2013 water sales or water metered water, not including Radeland, has been on a continuing de decline with the exception of last year. We're not exactly sure whether we've hit the plateau of metered water or whether last year the dry weather was an anomaly. But each year, this is the type of data that we utilize to budget and forecast next year's metered water to, to set our budget based on revenue. <laughs> So I've talked about meter water. Uh, this, I wanted to show an example of a utility bill. And the reason why I use the term utility bill is because Paducah Water, <clears throat> when, you, when you get a bill from Paducah Water, depending on the services that you receive, we bill for JSA and we also bill for city refuse. So a lot of time people say, I wanna pay my water bill. And for many of our customers, it means paying your water, sewer and refuse bill. So depending on the services that, that you receive, so let's say for 4,000 gallons, that's, a, that's close to a four person house, just a standard with newer fixtures. Your water bill would be around $31. But if you're in the city with water and sewer and refuse, that's, that, that, that bill represents a $74 bill. So uh, the inability to pay your water bill might mean your utility bill, but we're the bad guys with the logo <laughs> shirt if you don't in fact pay the water bill. And that's a challenge that, uh, uh, that we face, but I just wanted to, for a comparative, that's about what representative bills, and that's a residential meter, our smallest residential meter. I mentioned several times that there are some variables in budgeting. Uh, extreme weather events are probably the, the, the most pressing because during an extended drought, uh, we can pump a, a lot more water than we had anticipated by budget. We're, so Mother Nature has a significant amount of control, as is if we have a very wet, rainy period, very, very wet, rainy summer. People don't irrigate, the cooling load isn't there. And also extreme cold. Two of the largest days for moving water <clears throat> out of our plant came in the two cold weather events. One was Christmas of 22. And that was possibly our highest peak flow day that we've had in many years, as people were running faucets and we had small main, we had small breaks, we had service breaks on the, the premise plumbing, and it put a tremendous load on our on our system. So, so Mother Nature can can wreak havoc on on what it is we do. Source water quality. Our, our intakes are on the Ohio River that are impacted by the Tennessee. Regardless of what's what's presented to us, our water quality remains constant. So. The, the source water that we're prevented with, the cost of treatment can escalate or become lower depending on the quality of the water that comes to us that we're, we're tasked to treat. 
And the last variable is material availability and cost. Like everybody, coming through COVID, uh, we, we've seen materials and chemicals increase anywhere between 50 and 250% over four years. And availability, it wasn't that long ago that if you wanted a fire hydrant, it was going to be nearly 10 to 12 months. So that, that presented a tremendous amount of inventory that we had to bulk up and really plan to make sure that our inventory didn't hamper the growth and the projects and the things that we needed to do. So finally, I want to touch on a few challenges uh, that, that we see in the, in the near future. I think like everyone else, the three R's we're, we're dealing with retirement, the tier one retirements. We've, we have eight potential retirements within the organization within the next 15 months possible. Two department heads and one foreman are included in that eight. So we've been working on stabilization, redundancy, and resiliency within the organization for some time. But recruitment and retention, we have a fantastic team. And, you know, our, we're focused on retaining, recruiting the best talent and retaining those, those, those great staff members that we have to do what it is we need to do on a 24-7 basis. Like many other utilities across the, the nation, we're, we're going to be also dealing with some federal reg regulation that has taken place within the last couple of years. There has been a uh, movement at the federal level on uh, LCRR, or, or Lead and Copper Rule Revision, and PFAS that uh, we'll be looking, we're well positioned, but we're going to be uh, dealing with here within the next years that are challenges to, to literally thousands of utilities across the country, but we're well positioned to deal with those. And lastly, aging infrastructure. You know, some of our infrastructure approaches 140 years that has been put together over uh, many different water systems. There's a daily challenge. It's remarkable sometimes. One of our biggest challenges, what do we have and where is it? And it sounds, it, 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 it sounds, what do you mean you don't know where, you, where it is? Well, if it's a plastic main and we have no drawings, then part of the challenge is what, where is it before we can even begin the what do we do about it? So that's a continued challenge, but we're committed to reinvestment and uh, continue to improve the system in every way. So are there any questions? So are you saying that uh, you don't know where a lot of your, you don't know where a lot of lines are or you, you discover new things all the time? I mean... Both. And I don't mean, and I mean that with, with context, because there were construction methods in the 20s, 30s, and 40s that are far different than today. The materials were different, the, the, the technology, the use of tools were different. So in the city, in some of our older sections of town, we may dig on a leak and we find something that we hadn't seen in many, many years based on the construction practice of the day. So that's one of the things we're not sure what we get into because it's been buried for 110 years. Another example of when I say we don't know where it is, is when we have a, a PVC or a plastic line that can't really be located from the surface. If we don't have good drawings and that line was installed in 1972 in a rural part of our system, if we don't have drawings, we, we have no idea when it was installed or, or who installed it. Part of the challenge is that we can get within 20 feet or 30 feet, but if it's not, if we don't have a drawing that can get us in a direction or some information, our first task is to find that plastic line that can't be located by any other means. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I just point out one final thing. This is something that not a lot of people get to see. This is a nighttime Flushing. This was it looks like. This this is what it looks like when you put a nozzle on a fire hydrant and open it up wide wide open on one nozzle. So we have a nighttime flusher that does this full time every night. They run about 25 hydrants throughout our entire system to maintain the system. It's a fairly violent. It's it's amazing how noisy that is and rumbling the ground. But that's just a routine episode for us or a fire flow test. But but that's what it looks like. So how many hydrants? Speaking of hydrants, how many do we have in the city? 4,700 hydrants total within within the entire system. 4,700 hydrants. 4,700 hydrants, and since 2020, the price of those hydrants have doubled to buy a new one. So, they're four to five thousand a piece. Commissioner you Smith, to, you may want to mention something about uh, the telemetry that we're using for for reading meters. Yes. Yes, 
uh, we started in 2015 uh, an initiative to change out 100% uh, of our meters, the meter itself, the reading mechanism, fitting that reading mechanism with a cellular read disc and a new lid. So if you've seen the new blue lids, that's part of this overarching program. And we project being completely finished using in-house crews only this fall. So what that allows us to do and any customers is access water usage remotely. Just the water usage data is transmitted to an interface that customers can sign up. They can see their usage by hour. They can set up leak alerts. And we'll finally be complete with that initiative uh, this year. But it also allows us to troubleshoot if there's a leak. Where is the leak? How much is it? And that's, that's valuable data that's really improved our, cust our level of customer service because when we were reading 30 or 60 days on a meter, we have no idea what happened during those 30 days. And now we have the actual data that we can see what happened and when it happened. So it's been a tremendous asset for our customers and us as well. Wonderful for your customers. Very good. Any other questions? Questions for Jason? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Very informative. Okay, we'll move to public comments. We have uh, three people that have that would like to speak uh, tonight, and the first one is John Barry. <coughs> city clerk, city manager, commissioners, Mayor Bray. Uh, the issue tonight is still the noise ordinance. Um, this was about two weeks before the uh, chamber breakfast. Uh, the mayor told us at our house they were not enforcing the noise ordinance because there were so many ordinances that the city was not enforcing. Uh, two or three weeks later, he was at the chamber breakfast and he said, there's now music on the streets in the city of Paducah. I take that as a personal slap in the face. Um, that was like, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks, I don't know the date of it, but it was right before the, uh, when he was at our place, it was right before the commissioner breakfast. Uh, since then, I have had photos or, and uh, re recordings of uh, two individuals in Paducah where the police was at their place. One of them stated they didn't want to hear it 50 feet from the building. One of them states he didn't want to hear it in the street. And not picking on you, uh, Commissioner Smith, but I also have one of where you made a call for a guy playing a violin in a parking lot at Hannon Plaza. And I think that's probably two or three blocks from your house. And I don't blame you at all. I would have done the same thing. They did show up and the guy left. So I don't know what the difference is in, in that commercial property and the commercial property where I live. I live at 212A Broadway right in downtown Paducah. Uh, if you go down there, you're going to go, I'm sure you're going to go and be home by 11 or 12 o'clock. The issues there start about 1 o'clock in the morning and end at 3 or 4 in the morning. Uh, it's still going on. It's just terrible. It's, it's, uh, a lot of people are, are afraid to come say anything about it because of repercussions they get with their business. It's just not good. And, you know, if you're going to pass a new ordinance, and the mayor is going to be able to just say, we're not going to enforce the noise ordinance. Uh, I know the hierarchy goes from uh, uh, the police commissioner to uh, the police, the chief of police to the uh, city manager and to the, to the mayor. So the mayor is responsible for all these decisions. And I think he's responsible for the decision not to enforce the noise ordinance. So if we pass a new noise ordinance, is it going to be enforced or is it going to be like the old noise ordinance and not enforced. I think the old noise ordinance is not being enforced because of the 50-foot rule. That's not put in the new one that I could tell. I met with uh, Ms. Parrish and uh, we went through that, but I don't believe that was in the new noise ordinance about the 50-foot rule. So I think that's part of it and it's because we're downtown. The reverberation of music between brick buildings is terrible. You can be one building over and not hear it, and right in front of it, it'll blow you out of your chair. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Cheryl Sabota. Good 
he's not, never short enough. <laughs> uh, my name is Cheryl Sloboda, and I own a building in downtown Paducah. Um, I also have a business in downtown Paducah. And once again, I'm here to discuss the issue of the noise ordinance. Um, I think we can have a compromise and it needs to have everyone involved. The proposed changes are completely reasonable as long as they can be measured and they are enforced when needed. Um, I personally would like to recommend that any outward street facing speakers have some sort of zone that they can't be heard outside of. Um, we, shouldn't we certainly shouldn't be hearing another business a half a block away. So I'm proposing that there is some sort of bubble that if you have an outward facing speaker, it shouldn't be heard further away from a certain number of feet. And certainly um, I'm suggesting that you come and have a meeting with downtown stakeholders directly. Um, those of us that own the properties, those of us that own the businesses, come talk to us. Um, we have Paducah's best interests at heart. We want the same things. We want a positive and vibrant community. And we want to be continue to be a destination for tourists from around the world. Um, I'm very excited to see the appointment of Carol Galt as the interim planning director, but we would also encourage you to hurry and appoint Main Street board members who live and work downtown and in a timely fashion so that we can continue planning the rest of the year for downtown and also um, to come and compromise with us uh, to make everybody as happy as they can be downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And finally, Richard Kinnear. Did I, did I pronounce that correctly, Richard? Yeah. Good afternoon, evening. I'm Richard Kinnear. I am a business owner downtown as well as a resident of downtown. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments on, uh, A, the sound ordinance. Uh, we all know that the current one does not go into specifics adequately and was not enforced. So therefore, it's effectively neutered. And we can't have that. A lot of things, uh, but one of the things is, when reviewing the sound ordinances, it ended up being a, one group of people demonizing another group of people to cow them and stop them from commenting publicly. We know that. We know that from Facebook posts. We know that from signage put up. And that is not, a, instead of demonizing the people, we need to sit down and come to a compromise about things. And the whole idea of demonization was raised again at the Cars and Cigars event a couple of weekends ago, where attendees actually were acting in a threatening manner towards business owners downtown. Now, I know the mayor is aware of this because I emailed him directly about it, as some other people are. Now, one of the things is, within the, uh, within the permits, there is no re uh, requirement for security. It is an option. I think we need to look at that and address that. Because when business owners downtown were threatened or were acted towards in a threatening manner by attendees at this event, when the police were called, it took 21 minutes for the police to phone up to see if the business owners were still alive. They never showed up or anything. 21 minutes between the calls being made and a call back from the police. Not a thing. Now, I fully believe that we cannot put the pressure on the police to be monitoring these events. I believe everyone getting a permit for a street closure, whatever, that they must provide their own security or a separate security system set up external to the police. 
Downtown events are not cru uh, crucial enough for a mandatory police presence. They have other things to do that are more critical. But it does not negate the need for security at these events. Like we have open liquor laws. How many of the attendees at Cars and Cigars had coolers with liquor in them, which is against the law? No one was monitoring it. But, so we need to start looking at these. And we need to address the sound issue in a manner that compromises one way of saying it, but in a manner that the bully pulpit is not allowed to continue to get away with what they have been doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you everyone for being here. And we appreciate the, uh, the comments. Um, so we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is uh, items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted by one motion and one vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. City Clerk will read the uh, items recommended for approval unless any commissioner would like an item removed for separate discussion. Uh, aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. We'll remove item I. And I'll ask uh, the city clerk to please read the items recommended for approval. Approve minutes for the June 11th, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting. Receive and file documents. <clears throat> Appointment of Herbert Gregory to the Paducah McCracken County Senior Citizens Board. Said term shall run from July 1, 2024 to June 30th, 2027. Reappointment of Charles Chip Bowl, Patrick White, and Joseph Benberry to the Paducah Area Transit Bo Authority Board. Said term shall expire June 30th, 2028. Appointment of Jonathan Mark Davis and joint appointment of Will Cox to the Paducah McCracken County Joint Sewer Agency Board. Said term shall run from July 1, 2024 to June 30th, 2028. Reappointment of Mark Whitlow and joint reappointment of Alexandra Sherwood to the Paducah McCracken County Convention Center Corporation. Said term shall expire June 30th, 2027. Personnel actions, a municipal order authorizing and approving a reimbursement agreement between the City of Paducah and Paducah Waterworks for the South 24th Street waterline relocation for reimbursement of all expenses related to relocation, extension, and or new construction in an approximate amount of $157,000 and authorizing the mayor to execute the agreement. A municipal order adopting contract modification number one to the contract with HDR Incorporated for professional engineering design and co construction administration in an amount of $40,000 and authorizing the mayor to execute the contract modification in all documents related to same. A municipal order of the City of Paducah, Kentucky authorizing and approving an interlocal participation agreement for cooperative purchasing with By Board National Purchasing Cooperative and authorizing the execution of all documents related to same. A municipal order authorizing the mayor to execute all documents necessary to receive grant funds through the 911 Services Board grant program in the amount of $99,653 for the purchase of data data capture, recording hardware, and software for the Paducah Police Department, a municipal order authorizing the mayor to execute all documents necessary to receive grant funds through the state and local cybersecurity security grant in the amount of $50,000 to conduct internal and external cybersecurity vulnerability assessments. So moved. Second. Call roll. Commissioner Guess. Aye. Commissioner Henderson. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Bray. Aye. Okay, let's let's go ahead and take the first one that Commissioner Guest has to be pulled off. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled a Municipal Order Authorizing the Finance Director to Pay Kentucky League of Cities for Workers' Compensation, Liability Insurance, and Property Insurance <coughs> coverage in a total amount of $1,262,000. $94.99 for the City of Paducah and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same. I'm sorry, so moved. Second. Stephanie. Good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners, City Manager, City Clerk. 
Um, this particular item is for our annual uh, property and liability renewal. It includes auto, work comp, and uh, general liability. <clears throat> Were there any specific questions or? My only question, is, and I brought it up 20 years ago when, we just never bid this. I mean, I'm not saying Kentucky League of Cities isn't, doesn't give a good product, that we haven't gotten good service, but it's a really big number, mm -hmm. and a lot of this could be, you know, there's, there's other local companies that could give um, at least part of this. I understand cities are um, unique in a mm -hmm. lot of ways than they might have, but some of this stuff, I mean, uh, uh, isn't unique. That, that, that's my only, um, and the city manager, and I, I brought it up 20 years ago, and I know what was said then, so it might be. What was lot. said then, I wasn't uh, around. It, it kind of, I mean, Kentucky League of Cities, they're, they're unique. Cities are unique. We, we, have, we have needs that not every state farm, all state agent can do, but um, things are a little different now. I mean, we have local insurance companies that are bought out by bigger insurance companies, and um, uh, a, a small company can can provide a thousand employees medical insurance that you couldn't do 20 years ago. Uh, my experience in this, we work with um, it previously Pill in Holland, which is now Hub, and we do rely a lot on their guidance. We work directly with Roy Riley, the former owner of Peel & Holland, on knowing what's going on in the market to know if we are, in fact, if it's something we could bid out to another carrier. So whether, um, one, you know, being with KLC, that is something that we, we do through Hub, which is our broker. So it sounds like you're more interested in potentially the broker relationship. Well, why it wasn't... I want to know what other option we have. I understand what hub, but that is that is totally. We all know that's totally different than getting a apples and apples bid. They're wanting to make sure. Yes, you're not being overcharged. You're, mm -hmm. but I do heating and air, and there's people that will charge double what someone else does, and I guess it's all. So, so I don't think that's a that's a good explanation for that. Well, the the explanation would be that they are they are looking at our rates. And they have a ton of customers to know if it's something, well, this isn't reasonable, we should go to market. And they could go to market to other carriers, such as uh, Cincinnati or um, there, I believe, like Mutual um, has, has a product line as well. Yeah, I just, um, I guess my, we bid everything else. And then you know exactly and just trusting what a, I'm not saying I don't trust another. Mm -hmm. I, it's just, to me, I would rather keep a personality out of it. Let's look at three bids. And I mean, that's that was mine. I mean, that's a big number. And honestly, with workers' comp and how many employees we have, I think it's a very fair, you mm -hmm. know, don't hear me saying that. I think it's... it's um, right. And that, that one actually dropped this year pretty significantly. Um, over 8% because we have controlled our accidents and we have right. our mall it, rate down, so. Exactly, I, I just know, I know in my, in my field, you can go get 10 people, you'll get 10 different prices. And insurance the same way. I mean, I, that's mm -hmm. just. You hear anything, Dan? Yeah, I, I, it's a great, and you know, we did talk about that this morning, Commissioner, and um, you know, as we discussed the, um, you know, Hub is our, and as Stephanie pointed out, Hub's our, our broker, and they do that for us on our behalf. They don't just automatically say, you're going to go to KLC. I mean, they do look <clears> at that and give some feedback and then make a recommendation of what they see. Now, going forward, we definitely, if you, if this commission wants to uh, tell our broker we want to see a, uh, a formal bid process, that's your decision if you want to make it and, and ask them to do it. I would imagine there's going to be a fee for added to services for that. But our fee and our relationship with Hub International is they do that on our behalf and then bring us the recommendation back for that. <coughs> so, That's all I'm saying. Right. Is I, I knew the Hub would come up, and it is totally different mm -hmm. than a bid. I mean, they're looking to make sure we aren't being overcharged in what is normal practices and 
I'm just in the right, and we can get that information. Is I mean, it possible that HUD Hub, Hub has Hub. those documents where they had no, that it's not made, what they do made phone calls. To we those. can always ask. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the time frame where we go through this? I mean, this yeah, I'd what say we're it's probably too late for this one. Yeah. So, what is the time frame? When when does the process start? And a lot has to uh, typically a three month, a ninety day look back because they're going to look at your claims history, so and then kind of look at what's coming up ahead. Um, so, I would say a ninety day. But annually, we look at this annually. Uh, yeah. uh, is it? Oh, we we meet. Typically quarterly, quarterly, going over claims, looking at what's coming up, if, if it is something. This year we did make some changes to deductibles and increased liability amounts. So this this figure, $1.2 mm -hmm. million, dollars, is that a quarterly figure or is it an annual figure? That's annual. annual. That's an annual. And that's oh. everything. And that's it, it, not health insurance, but right. that is all P&C coverage. Okay. And, and as Stephanie mentioned, that's also, we had a, a significant reduction in our workers comp and um, part of that uh, is due just to our due diligence but also having um, the uh, risk manager um, on staff that helping us you know work through those yeah, as hopefully, well yeah hopefully and it did go down it did yeah. what it was mm -hmm. supposed yeah. to do right yeah. correct um, so um, well, yeah, we'll I, take your suggestion under advisement, yeah. and um, it's all I wanted. I, you know, all I, and I'm not and, saying Kentucky League of Cities is a very good partner. They, I, I was just sometimes you just like. I think that's an important piece to it too. They are a partner. Um, we're not just a client. We we work with them um, on numerous different areas for the city. But just one of the things, do you know where we rate as customers for Kentucky League of Cities? I don't. We could check. Okay. I mean, we're I think the only ones that aren't going to be there are going to be Louisville and potentially Lexington due to their size and being able to self-insure themselves. That's, that was just one of the things I had 20 years ago, is, and I would say that now. If we're the 16th largest city, which we are, then we ought to be the 16th best customer they have, and I think we're ahead of that. Does that make sense? I mean, that's just... You're saying other communities don't utilize it. I, I'm not I mean, saying... Are you thinking that's... They're, they're doing something different. That's all, all I'm saying. We'll take that under advisement. Yeah. Okay. Any Thank other you. comments? No. Good. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, call roll, please. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, the next item is uh, board appointments uh, to the Paducah Riverfront Development Authority. Um, and I, um, I wanted to talk about this just for a second because uh, we have a riverfront development project that's getting ready to kick off uh, downtown. And it's a project that we've worked on for many years and we've actually had a riverfront development uh, authority uh, committee in place for some time. Actually, there's there's a long history here, and um, I was looking back at some of the history of this, and uh, it was originally, um, uh, you know, designed to assist, advise the city uh, on the development of projects uh, downtown around the uh, riverfront, and. Um, and so this this committee, when they when they will be formed, as they are formed, um, and Commissioner Wilson is um, is an ex officio uh, member of that committee, um, <clears throat> they will need to get together and talk about exactly how they can best function in order to help us uh, move forward with the riverfront, um, because the riverfront development project is really getting ready to. Uh, we're, we're getting ready to put a shovel in the ground, but I think that there's going with with the hotel project still sitting out there uh, There's going to be opportunities for this board to come together and uh, And provide a device and council recommendations to the Commission um, So I just want to kind of wanted to call out 
um, the folks that have volunteered and raised their hand uh, to be involved in this committee. And um, <clears throat> so we got Paul Gurrier, uh, Upinder Meehan, uh, Ashley McMillan, Alicia Wins Winslow, uh, and Julie Harris. And uh, so I wanted to, uh, I've talked with all of them. They're very uh, enthused about getting involved with you, Sandra, uh, Commissioner Wilson, and um, uh, being involved with, uh, with the Riverfront Development uh, so, Committee. So the, river, the definition of riverfront is, I mean, I would normally think it'd be on the river side of the flood wall. That's not necessarily so in this origin. You know, um, I don't see that definition in here anywhere. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, just, but, I'm just thinking how I would do it. Right. So, well, because that would be kind of downtown. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just, I guess yeah. that's a point of clarification. I would say having served on it before, it was the, more of the riverside, of the riverfront, where we were looking at it from design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bill Grant, all of that. But, you know, the river, I mean, it's the focus of our downtown. And so it, you know, it, uh, you know, it means so much to the community. I mean, we got, uh, you know, the riverboat, new riverboat dock that's going to be part of this project. So um, it, it could bleed over into a lot, you know, several other things. So, um, but at any rate, <clears throat> I just wanted to call out that, you know, this committee is, is uh, being established. And uh, so uh, any, any questions? Okay, I would ask uh, our city clerk to read the motion. A proposed motion that the Board of Commissioners approve the action of Mayor Bray in the following Paducah Riverfront Development Authority appointments. Appointment of Paul Grio for a term that shall expire June 25th, 2026. Appointment of Upinder Mihan for the term that shall expire June 25th, 2027. Appointment of Ashley McMillan for a term that shall expire June 25th, 2027. Appointment of Julie Harris for a term that shall expire June 25th, 2028. An appointment of Alicia Winslow for a term that shall expire June 25th, 2028. So moved. Second. Call roll, please. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. So we'll move to municipal orders. Um, and. So the first one, um, I'll ask the city clerk to please read it. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled, a municipal order adopting Title VI program plan for the city of Paducah for July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. So moved. Second. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good evening again, Mayor, City Commissioner, City Manager, City Clerk. Federal um, regulations require recipients of federal funds to implement non-discrimination plans. <clears throat> For the public sector, those are Title VI programs of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The, tra the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet is working with the City of Paducah to implement a Title VI program to meet these regulations, promoting equality and preventing discrimination. This program plan is designed to meet the U.S. Department of Transportation, including the Federal Highway Administration's requirements for Title VI, specific to funds received for the BUILD grant. The Title VI program prevents discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in federally assisted programs. It upholds the civil rights principles, ensuring no individual is excluded or discriminated against in federally funded activities. The main objectives of the Title VI program include promoting equity, preventing discrimination, and fostering inclusivity across the organization. So who is involved? Financial assistance um, stakeholders in the Title VI program include financial assistance providers, <coughs> which are U.S. Federal Highway Administration and the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. The governing body for the plan is the City of Paducah Mayor and Board of Commissioners. 
Requirements for implementation, compliance, and reporting belong to the city manager. Oversight and coordination with Title VI statutes, regulations, directives belongs to the Title VI coordinator. All employees must be trained and aware. Subrecipients, contractors, and other stakeholders must comply as well. So the designated officials within the organizations hold responsibilities for enforcing Title VI regulations, monitoring compliance, and implementing necessary measures to prevent discrimination and activities. Collaboration efforts involve partnerships between agencies, organizations, and communities to promote the inclusivity, address concerns, and enhance the effectiveness of the implementation. Compliance involves proactive measures to address any potential violations and ensure equity and program delivery. Efficiently preventing discrimination requires robust policies, staff training, and proactive monitoring. Non-compliance can result in the loss of funding, legal repercussions, and damage to the city's reputation. Implementing effective prevention strategies is crucial to uphold the <coughs> Title VI principles and values. The core components of a program include policies, complaint proce procedures, monitoring systems, and community engagement. These elements work collectively to maintain compliance, prevent discrimination, and enhance accountability within organizations. Aligning program components effectively is essential for <coughs> successful Title VI implementation. Training staff on Title VI regulations, diversity, and non-discrimination practices enhances their ability to uphold these principles, fostering an inclusive workplace. These are not new components to the city as we already had many policies that relate to discrimination in the workplace. They are just now formalized into a document to comply specifically with the U.S. Department of Transportation. Implementing Title VI program positively impacts communities by ensuring equal access to services, programs, and opportunities. It promotes inclusivity, reduces discrimination, and fosters a more cohesive and supportive community environment. This program will be renewed annually and a, a disability non-discrimination policy will be effective July 1st as well to coincide with the Title VI program. Does anyone have any questions? This was things we were already doing. It is. I mean, I think it is. For sure, yes. But, but, but haven't I already taken some training that's related to this? That is, yes. Okay. So everybody has to be trained by the end of this okay. month. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. kind of why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Well, so we know that, that we need to keep up with our training mm -hmm. and make sure that the, that's, it will be that's why it's important, certainly. So as a federal grant recipient, which is essentially the build grant, well, and other, I mean, I mean, any other, any, any, any other, other federal, yeah, the Title VI okay. has been a, is a requirement for federal grant programming recipients for this one. Um, the Federal Highway Administration, which this is largely based on, has uh, has um, changed theirs, and so it's necess necessitated us to come into compliance with their newer updates. Okay. And so in future years, we'll... It'll we'll be a mind, unless there's a major change at, at one of the levels. Okay. Well, the, correct. So this right. will be renewed every right. year. Moving forward, it would be on the consent agenda to mm -hmm. renew each year. Training must occur every year. We have to hold any of our subcontractors um, compliant to this as well. So there's language that we'll need to go into all of our future agreements. Um, and should we receive funding from another federal agency, so Department of Agriculture, they would have a specific Title VI program they would need implemented as well. Mm, great. Another one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stephanie, I know that we're doing uh, some of this uh, in terms of training. Mm -hmm. I already I understand that. But my questions are these. Um, how will, how will we, what other trainings will we do <coughs> This go around, it has not been done before. How will it be evaluated? 
And is there any kind of penalty for those who don't do it? Because, because I, I, I think that there are some trainings that we've had that employees haven't necessarily gone through. Perhaps they hadn't seen the value of it. And I don't know what has happened to those employees who did not, did not participate in what we required as a mandatory training. That makes sense. I believe so. So th those are kind of looking at two separate scenarios. So there, there's one that is to comply that goes specifically through the policies that we're implementing, which is what the most recent training. But then we also have our diversity specialist who is working on the, the more inclusivity, minority inclusion within both the workplace and um, externally in the community as well. So she is just finishing up, I believe this week, a certification related to um, being a certified DEI specialist. And with that, she is, um, I don't have a significant amount of ideas of what the new trainings will look like, but there will be um, smaller kind of cohort training. So giving people, employees, a menu of options. So if they want to join a book club based upon a particular topic, if um, it's a training that they want to attend specific to something that interests them, that's internally where, where we're focusing on that particular. Um, so how will we evaluate, how will we make sure that employees, staff are indeed participating and putting into practice what they're learning. I get to me. It would be: Are we receiving complaints? Are we having issues um, within the departments where whether employees aren't getting along? Um, doing surveys to get feedback if they found the trainings valuable. Those would be a few ideas I would have. Do you have some sort of specific no, example I, I, I of don't something? Know. I just that know that when we do things like this, not necessarily the city, when we do things like this, we make uh, bold statements of what we will do and how we will do, but there's never any information put out there that says we're doing it, we're putting it into practice, and our organization is changing, the culture is changing because we are doing it. And so I, I just don't think it's, it, it makes a whole lot of sense to me that we go through something to say we're doing it but we don't have anything to show us, we're making progress. And I don't think that uh, just not hearing complaints is necessarily a, uh, a measuring stick for things are going well, but some folks just don't make complaints and they just go on and do what they do. But there are problems all through the organization, and that's what I'm trying to get at, how we will do that. You're saying we do have problems all through the no, organization? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying that there can be problems mm -hmm. throughout the organization, but we don't know that there are problems because they don't come and people don't step up and say there's a problem. So all I'm looking for is, is implementation. How do, we, how, do we see, how do we see a culture change? And I know that's not going to change tomorrow or overnight. It is a process, but I'm, I'm figure, trying to figure out what do we need to be looking for so that we can see this change taking place. And that's a very valid valid point. Thank you for bringing that up, Commissioner. We, uh, I believe that part of part of that aspect of our new team member uh, in HR, uh, they show that will be part of her role and responsibility, is as that follow up. Yeah. Uh, and we've talked about that internally. Is that you know when we have a training, again, Stephanie pointed out what we're talking about here is something separate than what the the internal. This is the, specific to the Title VI. But an evaluation component, we do need to be able to track. Right. So we do need to define metrics yeah. that we can look at and yeah. see. And yeah. so, yes. Yeah, and I understand that. But And the other part of this is that I, I know we have a new DEI specialist. But what I wouldn't want to see is to expect the DEI specialist to come in and wave the magic wand. Mm -hmm. And if certain things are not working or if certain things are not happening, then it becomes the ineffectiveness of the DEI specialist. Yeah. 
No. I, yes. I, you know, right. No, no, I know we wouldn't do that, right. but I just thought I'd throw right. it out there. No, <laughs> <laughs> no and this is good. I mean, I think if we set those benchmarks and work mm -hmm. with, and, and that's that's part of the, or getting the training and things like that is, is getting up to speed is, mm -hmm. is how that, and, but as always, we staff, uh, our team welcomes, you know, uh, the input and support uh, and, and the work with the commission to help develop those. You know, Commissioner, you're asking the most difficult of questions, mm -hmm. which is, you know, how do you change somebody's mind, somebody's heart, somebody, I mean, how, you know, and then how do you measure that? Well, I thought and that's what we're supposed to do, change people's hearts and minds. That's what we're working <laughs> on. <laughs> <clears throat> I do know she's meeting with each director, and I believe yeah. she's met with the mayor mm -hmm. to kind of figure out what's going to work for your department yeah. because they're all in different places. With and I know she has the support of our, of our mayor and commission and our department heads. I just want to make sure that we mm -hmm. keep an eye. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you. Please call roll. Commissioner Guess. Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, from here uh, we have um, some pretty big things to talk about. We have four different municipal orders. We want to read these separately and vote on each one of them separately. Uh, but I think maybe we, uh, Darren, you want to talk about, you want to give an overview before we ask um, Lindsay to read all of them. Sure. And yeah, so uh, Mayor Commission and uh, members of our community, uh, the, the next items that we'll be discussing uh, is pertaining to uh, the second reading and the adoption of the approval of the recommendation from uh, the Sports Tourism Commission uh, and as it relates to the Paducah Sports Park. Um, the, uh, the different uh, aspects that we'll be looking at tonight and con for consideration, uh, not only just the general contract uh, overall, which uh, you'll hear from presentation, um, I think uh, that, uh, that Steve Irvin uh, is, is ready to make or to answer any questions that we heard from it, or is it Jeff? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and hey, we've got a team to answer those questions. Uh, you know, it'll be about, uh, you know, $65.6 million uh, in total, uh, but that does, um, you know, that, that does look at your turf, that does look at your construction, uh, that does look at your lighting, uh, does look at your buildings and your FF&E um, aspects of, of that. And so um, we can, you know, uh, Madam Clerk, if, if you would read through all of them, um, and then we can do it individually or approval, however, you know, a, as one. But, but I think before we have the vote, we probably would like to hear from the presenters. Yes. Okay, I'll start with the first one. Um, a proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled a municipal order approving the recommendation of the McCracken County Sports Tourism Commission to accept the bid package for site field turf for the Paducah Sports Park project in the amount of $6,321,087 and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same. So moved. Second. So we want to vote now, or we want to? I think we should vote on each one as we. Okay. So through. so let's let's take there. so that one, and then we'll have the presentation on the larger portion of it. Or do you want to do the presentation now? Yeah, let's go on and okay. let's hear from everybody now. I mean, let's. Uh, Steve, you want to come up and. and Amy and. I don't really have anything formal. Um, I'm just Steve, last time he was here, kind of walked through the budget and the allowances that we have set aside for the unknowns, um, the grandstand specifically. We have some money set aside in this budget um, to help us figure out what we want to do with that. Um, FF&E, we have an allowance for that. So just any questions that you have specifically, these are all the low bidders. Um, they were all low bidders. We went through cost reductions to kind of get them down within this budget. And then um, these are the... Uh, Recommendations from the sports term. So let's talk about what we are going to vote on, what what uh, the bids represent, and then what they don't represent. 
so what we're not going to vote on, you know, i.e., uh, the grandstands, sure, uh, championship field, uh, that sort of thing. Sure. So, so the sprint turf <clears throat> contract is for the turf um, for all of the fields, with the exception of the championship field. Um, and so that is the only deduction out of their contract was the work that would go into the turf, the site prep for the turf um, is part of their contract. So this amount covers everything else. So this, this 6.321087 6 is uh, on just the field turf. In Correct. The construction and that's the, the four deduction. the four diamond fields and then the five, uh, well, two pods and then one soccer field. So there was a question. I actually attended the fiscal court meeting last night. And so there was a question that came up about uh, the grandstands and what we do with that. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion, uh, you know, the good, the bad. Um, you know, and I think um, uh, Judge Clymer, the county, uh, would like to figure out uh, a way uh, to get that grandstand paid for so that it could be part of the project. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, when we did the, the performance, you know, for the, um, for the entire sports park, um, the, the championship field was in there. And so the championship field is now not in there. Uh, because we had to reduce the bids. So um, kind of the question is, you know, the, the, the fiscal court talked last night about, you know, six months, eight months, uh, you know, to see if the county could raise, could come up with money, you know, from an outside source. They talked about grants, state grants, federal grants, something like that at, at um, you know, and that's that's an issue that's sitting out there because all of us, uh, you know, the judge asked all of us to go out and, you know, walk up in the grandstands, look at what the field looks like. You know, I think we've all done that. And um, so I guess my question is, at what point, uh, I mean, I don't think we want a sports park out there with a, you know, with a, 40-year-old grandstand that needs renovation. So at what point, you know, do we make that decision? Uh, and the county's been leading on this project, so I know that they'll be, uh, you know, they will be discussing it at future fiscal court meetings. But I'm, I'm curious as to what point in the construction process, you know, would, uh, I guess I start out by asking what is the total time that's going to that's going to be required to have us fielding teams. Is that 24 months, 18 months? Um, the contract is for 505 days, so we anticipate it will be done the fall of 25, which really kind of sets us up for spring of 26 for opening opening events. 505 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now the. Um, step in at any point. Um, the grandstand and the championship field is going to fall somewhere between 11 and 12 million as it is right now, as we've designed it and planned for it right now. Um, we do not, as a team, we do not want to open the sports park with the grandstand not being resolved. So I imagine that the design of that, the redesign of that, whatever that looks like, will be coming in the next few months so that we can get moving on that part of the project as well. Because when we when we open the park, we don't want we don't want an old dilapidated building sitting there. We want something, whether it's a renovated facility or if it's something new, we want that taken care of as part of the opening. Oh. Has that price increased since last week? I'm I'm being I'm being conservative. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, it was yeah. around eleven million, but okay. it, it, so. for the two. Okay. We had we had talked about the championship field being about 2.2, and the grandstands uh, between eight and nine. Yeah. But just so I understand, you're busy, or the group's busy, getting costs available, to so that we know what our options are. Like, get rid of the grandstands, put this in, um, you know, or 
renovate the grandstands to this level, renovate the grandstands? Is that what you're... Doing? Yeah, there's a couple of ideas. Um, I mean, simply, it could be that we uh, completely get the building, uh, make it an open-air style pavilion on the bottom level, and then an open grandstand on the top. Um, it still has to meet code, so there's a lot of renovations yeah. that still have to happen, even if we just do that minimally. Um, two, as much as completely demoing the site and putting something back, um, is similar to like maybe Brook Stadium or something like that. So there's a couple of ideas that we haven't really um, discussed a whole lot. We just, we know we want something Scott, there. Get some ideas and some calls. Yeah, and there's some allowances there for the design team to kind of work through that. And, and just for understanding and, and for those that may be watching at home, you know, what you're voting on tonight is not that aspect. That would yeah. come back to this body uh, as a contract modification. I think one question might be, so we don't hold up the, how long do you need to do something to the grandstand so we don't hold up the opening of the park with, uh, with a, not that not being finished? Go ahead. Um, at, at what we're doing right now, the, the contractors, once we, if everything is approved tonight, we'll issue notice of award tomorrow. Uh, they are already working on potential construction schedules, scheduling of things. And so once we see kind of their first draft of how they see the schedule going, we can better respond to that question. Um, uh, you know, given 505 days, a decision on the grandstand needs to be made uh, sooner than later. We don't want to rush into it, but we know time is of the essence. Uh, so, um, so we'll know a little bit more in the next week or two uh, as we start to plan kickoff meetings, construction meet, you know, pre-construction meetings and all that. Um, so we're, but we know, you know, we, we've been thinking, as, as Amy said, we've been thinking and, and, you know, formulating ideas and thoughts, but have not gone so far as to put anything to paper yet because we need to just, we need to get through this step first, <clears throat> so. What, what is the cost about of doing this, this, uh, I won't do an exercise in my way, doing this iteration of set of, making the plans or potential plans or estimates on saving the grandstand. I mean, you know, if we get down here and we spent, I'm making up because I have no idea, $400,000 on to a potential plan to save the grandstand, you know, it, it could be, and maybe the will isn't to save the grandstand. You, you know what I'm getting at. I mean, how do we... Man, yes, sir. I, we, and, that, and I think that's what we want to know is, is what the will is before we do any, before we, I, I think we can, we can come up with some concepts and some ideas and some, some, uh, maybe some rough estimates on, you know, if we stripped it down bare and, and made it, you know, simplified the plan, uh, or if we totally removed it from the site, what that may cost. I think we need some of that information for the, the folks that need to make the decision to make the decision. Um, but we, what we don't want to do is spend money and time designing something okay. when we don't know what we're doing yet. So you can do um, like a 30%. So. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, if that, uh, we, it's probably going to be more of a very schematic or conceptual level uh, so that uh, decisions can be made with some information provided. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions, commissioners? So I want, just before, I, I'm adding these up, it's a, we're $65 million is what we ended up, right? And, I think 65.6. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so if I add these four things, does that come up to 65.6? If it doesn't, it's probably my math and not, not necessarily wrong. Yeah, 65, 625. <laughs> it should. It should. It came directly yeah, from the, the uh, SPCs or the SFCs breakdown. Yeah. It doesn't come to 65. Right? Uh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. That The FF&E is it's not in here. Oh, okay. So this is just the contracts that we're approving, and then we have more budgeted for FF&E. So the FF&E so is like nine, right. eight or nine? With soft costs, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, so is that what? Is, our money's had already been spent for engineering plus yeah. the dog park, other things. Okay. So this is the same thing that the fiscal court approved last night? Those contracts, yes. Okay. All right. I think that's all the questions I have. And now I'll let the city clerk read. Uh, are we going to call read? roll on? A call roll on the first, first one. Okay. Please call roll. Commissioner Guest? Aye. 
Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Do you want us to stay put for the others? Just in case there's a question. I would hate to okay. save you some steps. Happy, happy to. Take the motion. Uh, okay, you can read the next motion, please. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled a municipal order approving the recommendation of the McCracken County Sports <coughs> Tourism Commission to accept the bid package for field lighting for this Paducah Sports Park project in the amount of $2,264,000. $475 and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same. So moved. Second. <laughs> Y'all talk so much, we just forget what's going on. <laughs> Any questions from commissioners on this? Please call roll. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, read the next one, please. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled a municipal order approving the recommendation of the McCracken County Sports Tourism Commission to accept the bid package for general site <coughs> construction and building construction for the Paducah Sports Park project in the amount of $47,771,839 and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same. So moved. <laughs> Second. Okay. Call roll. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. And the final bid package? A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled a municipal order approving the recommendation of the McCracken County Sports Tourism Commission to accept the bid package for food and beverage services for the Baduga Sports Park project in the amount not to exceed 608 thousand eight hundred and thirty three dollars and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same. So moved. Second. Call roll please. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. The deed is done. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a long time coming. Uh, it's a very important project for the community and uh, everybody you know there's I don't believe I've ever been involved in a in a project that had more uh, unanimous support as it went from a 42 million dollar project to a uh, really a doubled when you look at everything that we originally talked about up to you know almost 80 million uh, we were able to shave it back, you know, to 65 million. Uh, nobody has come up to me in the community and said, man, we can't do that project because it's too much. Hmm. And so there's been, uh, you know, I know people have had some raised eyebrows. It's a lot of money, um, but it's time to get started on it and reap the benefits from travel tourism. And it's gonna help put more people in our hotels and uh, so there's a lot of benefits to the community. So congratulations, everybody. No fanfare. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go? Woo! I would say it's been a long time since we kicked yeah. the balls out on the McCrack County Courthouse lawn. Yeah. I heard Commissioner Jones say that last night, and I thought it's been a long time since we did that. Did you kick balls on I the? I did. Hmm. I had my grandson with me. Okay. All right, and now we have uh, the 911 ordinance, uh, our second reading. We're ready to adopt it tonight. Um, there's been a lot of lot of discussion, a lot of hard work put into this. Um, I'll let uh, I'll let our city clerk uh, read uh, the motion, and then we can talk about where we are with this before we vote. A proposed motion that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance establishing and imposing a fee on all occupied real estate parcels located within the territorial limits of the city <clears throat> of Paducah to facilitate funding for the provision of joint 911 services as more fully set forth in the interlocal cooperation agreement between the city of Paducah and McCracken County. 
This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance establishes an annual parcel fee on all occupied individual residential units and all occupied individual commercial, religious, charitable, educational, and public use units located within the territorial limits of the city of Paducah. Parcel fees shall be placed upon the city of Paducah's property tax bills beginning with the 2024 tax bill and continuing every year thereafter. The due dates will be the same as the property tax due dates set by the Board of Commissioners. In the first year, occupied rental units will be eligible to claim a rebate of $22.50 per unit against the annual fee due in accordance with KRS 83A.060, the following section of the ordinance, which impo imposes fees, is hereby set forth in full. The Board of Commissioners hereby imposes the following annual parcel fees on all parcels of occupied real property as more accurately defined in Section 3 through 5 of this ordinance, which are located in the jurisdictional limits of the City of Paducah. Super commercial, limit, uh, super commercial unit contains structure in excess <coughs> of 25,000 square foot at $1,550. Large commercial unit contains structure between 7,500 and 25,000 square foot at $860. Medium commercial unit contains structure between 2,500 and 7,500 square foot at $325. Small commercial unit structure between 1 and 2,500 square foot at $210. Parking lots, which shall include but not be limited to parking lots, garages, or other areas designated for <coughs> parking of motor vehicles, as defined by KRS 186.010, subsection 4, whereby the owner, occupant, lessee, or possessor of any portion of the parcel leases, rents, licenses, bails, or otherwise allows the parking or storage of motor vehicles in exchange for consideration at $150. Public use units, emergency services, governmental, religious, charitable, and educational at $35, and residential units at $45. In the event a parcel is mixed use, the parcel shall be assessed at the highest applicable assessment rate. So moved. Second. Discussion. I don't, I'm, I'm still not, I mean, to quote, I don't like the, uh, spit it out, David, the fees. I mean, I, I just, you know, Walmart, yes, does have a big one. But as you said last time, they're used 100 times more. So I just, um, I, I, I just have a problem with the, with the fees. I just don't think that, um, I understand some people put a lot of work into it, but. You, you know. don't, th you think the fees are too high? You think uh, the fees I, I, are I inequitable? I don't think that Walmart should pay the same as a 25,000 square foot. Um, there's you more think they should pay there. more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you want to say that, I mean, I haven't, um, I mean, just the larger, the ones that are, I mean, a storage building, I was just thinking storage building, they're going to have to pay something, but what size is someone calling them? I, I just don't know. I just don't see, and some storage buildings are very big, and so I, I, I just don't see the, um, the consistency maybe is a better word. But again, I, I know it's hard to do it, and some people have done a lot of hard work on that. Well, we, um, uh, we, uh, uh, we modeled this. Uh, we worked, you know, with other counties uh, where they had established it. Uh, you know, our fees are, are, are lower than the county. Uh, that we modeled it after, you know, Kenton County is kind of where we start and right. modified it for McCracken County, City of Paducah, McCracken County. Um, we also are establishing establishing an appeals board, um, and and in talking with Kenton County, uh, their appeals board the first year, the first couple of years was very active because there was a lot of people that came in uh, wanting to talk about it you know, and and file an appeal. So I feel like that, you know, we will have some, <clears throat> excuse me, activity on our appeals board. Um, you know, this was discussed at the fiscal court la meeting last night, and I, I would say that um, it's a complex uh, ordinance. Uh, there has been a lot of work put into it. Um, it's not perfect, uh, and I feel like that, well, I know, <clears throat> can, can <clears throat> Excuse me, Kenton County, uh, I know, established their ordinance over 10 years ago, and they've made quite a few changes 
uh, I say through the years, amendments, if you will, uh, to try, as they as they learn, you know, about um, how to implement. Um, on the other side of that <clears throat> is that it's time to move. I mean, I simply that. because um, you know we don't have 911 coverage here. We have a new system ordered. We've already passed the interlocal agreement. <clears throat> so I think um, you know I'm 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 open to you know anybody's discussion, but um, you know for me, I, I think as long as we have the ability, I mean each year we'll learn and we can <clears throat> we can. Tweak or adjust sure. things to get closer to anything perfection. we don't perceive as, yeah. <laughs> we'll never reach perfection, but but we do have flexibility. So, I, city, I think, sorry. Well, city manager, <coughs> thing, not on necessarily on your rates, but on the way it was going to be applied to like a landlord that owns a lot of apartments. Mm -hmm. I think there was some concern about they had to turn all that in or something by, eight, by, by August, the, yeah. August, and it, that now has, has been, been extended to meet that need it, yes and so what uh, one of the 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 edits from the first reading was this clarified that they would get a rebate to be able to apply for a rebate on what they are built for uh, uh, in that first year for a, a, of 2250 per unit which is basically half and there's a different deadline for that yeah. of when they have to turn that in so yeah. I think you have yeah. made some revisions it's mm -hmm. is it perfect no do we want to I mean, do we even want to do it? No, but I also want 911 yeah. when I call. Yes. Yes. I want somebody to respond to the emergency. I agree, totally. Amen. <laughs> and, and, I, <laughs> and I've I, called it, so I want them there to help right. and to be responsive. Yeah. Hey, Commissioner Smith, I think, you know, as we get into this, uh, we will see a lot of things that we can do differently and then we can begin to adjust all of that to fit who we are and the needs that we have. So I think, you know, days ahead will be you know, some it, different things. I'll have to say this is a this is really a tough thing because it's not pleasant to you know, to to deal with this kind of stuff, but that's kind of things that we're elected to do is to try to find the best solution. I do appreciate Commissioner Guest's comments. I mean I think that there are you know, absolutely, businesses, uh, commercial entities out there that are that are going to be, how do you put it? You know, lower users than others, and and we'll look at it as being less equitable than others. Um, but we have to make a call. Uh, we have to, you know, we put a lot of time and effort in this, and it's something we will continue uh, continue to look at and uh, consider amendments for. And the selection of that appeals board, uh, in my view, is going to be very important, uh, picking the right people, because I think they're going to be busy. So um, I would also just uh, remind, and, and, may, and for understanding from the public as well, is that <clears throat> state law requires that these funds, as they are collected, they go into a pot, and they can only be used for the operations and debt service on 911. Actually, they can't even been used for the radios that help for 911 that are carried either on the hip or they are. Uh, those, you know, it's prescribed how that, and in any given year, if more money is collected by the fees that are established uh, than what is needed, then those funds roll over into the next year, have to be used in that next year, and you have to adjust the rates downward to where you're not in that continuous cycle of, of having that. So there's some built-in, and, and plus the appeals board as well is built-in on that. And if that. someone has a landline, then that fee goes away. And it, right. And we don't, and the, I know conversation is also has surrounded about uh, cell phones fees. Local jurisdictions have no no jurisdiction over setting the, the, the cell phone fee. Matter of fact, there's a formula uh, that, that the state sets up. Uh, the state's revenues uh, that are collected uh, on cell phones have continued to increase. What they have given back to local jurisdictions, in our case, it's only about $400,000 annually that comes back, uh, has been flat. And so we have, mm. while we all pay that, if we have cell phones or, or multiple cell phones, this body, fiscal court, has no jurisdiction over setting that fee or how, how much of that fee is returned back to the community that is at a state level. I think, didn't we look that up on your, some of your bills? It was less than a dollar. 70 cents. 70, 70, cents. Cents, 70 cents is what the state uh, has set that as. Okay. 
Uh, if it so that's is, that's what you're currently paying seventy right. cents per per cell month. phone. Yeah, per, per cell month. phone. Yeah, <coughs> and, and again, this body. And then now, if it's a prepaid prepaid phone, I think it's ninety five. I'm, I'm not sure on that one, but I do know seventy five on standard cell. And a lot of that is skipped at the state, state level. level. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Make it back. It doesn't make yeah. a very, let's say, nominal amount. I, and we have no control as to what we get back on that. I, I do want to call out you know, the fact and just reemphasize to you know to our to all of us, uh, you know, the county has come with us as 50-50 partners. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of angst, you know, about uh, about the city running a 911 and the county being a full partner. Um, and and our police department uh, has done an exceptional job. Of running 911, and and all the users, the county fire departments, the sheriff, the folks on the county side, have have admitted that, and and have complimented our police department on what on the way that 911 is being run, and so we are in a good place. Um, the county is has agreed to become a full 50/50 partner. Uh, this is an important date in Paducah history, uh, that that has taken place. We've been working on this on this 911 uh, ever since I've been elected, three and a half years ago, and, and I know for several years before that. So we made a lot of progress. We're here at the precipice, and I'd like to ask the city clerk. Well, just one, one more point, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. You're, you're if the one thing, and this <laughs> came up, is that it's also, these are not stacked the county collects theirs, the city. So if you are a city resident, you're not paying the city and county fee on this. It is just a single fee. Yeah. It's not and it staff. is in the county it and is, the city. The same, and the ILA just says, right, this, the ILA says that both bodies will adopt the same fee structure. <clears throat> but if you are a city resident, you're not paying the right. county fee on it. You're only paying the city. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Please call roll. Commissioner Guess. Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Hey, kudos, Mayor, for all the work that you've put on this, because you have no tell how many hours you've put on this. So, and I know it wasn't easy. It was very complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, we, have, um, we have one ordinance to introduce tonight, and I'll ask the city clerk to read it, and then uh, we've got representatives from our Section 8 um, um, program here. A proposed motion that the Board of Commissioners introduce an ordinance entitled, an ordinance adopting the annual operating budget for the Paducah, <coughs> Kentucky, Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program for the fiscal year July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025 by estimating revenues and resources and appropriating funds for the operation of said program. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance adopts the annual operating budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2024 and ending June 30th, 2025 for the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. So moved. Second. Lasika. Lasika. <laughs> Welcome. Joseph. All right. So uh, we're entering a new fiscal year, July 1. And so what we're going to do is propose that our administrative funds for salaries and <clears throat> office supplies and all the things that we purchase that are not HAP dollars be approved by the city. We did um, go in front of our board, which is with the Housing Authority of Paducah, who manages our agency, to get this uh, <coughs> resolution approved for for us for the Section 8 program. Do you have any questions? I just basically, I mean, we don't really have any control over this. Correct. Of course not. I mean, I know that we, <laughs> it, I know it's important that we do the check, but there's really no. There's no say so. Um, when we were a part of the city, uh, we were a part of the planning department and um, we still had a separate budget even from the planning department. So the budget is separate. There's no funding coming from any of our city entities, municipalities. It's all coming from the federal government, which is our administrative funds for our budget for the fiscal year. So 
We just have to still continue to come in front of the city to make sure that you guys are aware that we still have to have our budget approved and for you to file and record this information so we have it on file. So it's a bit of a, I don't want to call it an anomaly, but, but we've, been, we've been working to get Section 8, you know, uh, with the Housing Authority and away right. from the city. Absolutely. And we've been working for a number of years to do that. Absolutely. And I don't know if we're any closer. I'm, 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 I'm sensing that we might be a little closer. Uh, but well, the one is, thing that I'll add to that is that we have moved our building or our department over to the Housing Authority. So that's one step that we've accomplished in 2018. So this is 2024. We are still working on HUD. So we have provided some information to them uh, for an agreement between the city, the Housing Authority, and Section 8 to make these things change in the near future. But we are dealing with the federal government, so there's time involved. Okay. <laughs> Joseph, anything to add? We're playing Where's Waldo, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they are aware uh, they did receive the letters. I did have a brief discussion with um, <clears throat> our HUD rep. So he said, you know, they will be moving on that, you know, as fast as they can. So. Okay. Okie dokie. Any questions? Uh, no, none from me. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here. Okay, um, that's it for the agenda. Any comments from city manager? Uh, Mayor Commission just wanted to uh, point out and uh, send uh, some congratulations to our team in finance. For the 33rd year in a row, they have received the Government Finance Officers Association Excellence Award. Uh, that is for uh, their efforts where they go above and beyond the basic standards of public financial management. And so. Uh, we'll be issuing a, a press release uh, about that, but uh, we just wanted to say congratulations to our team down in finance for continuing uh, that longstanding tradition. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, they do such a great job taking care of taxpayer money and uh, led by, you know, Jonathan and Audra, so they're doing a great job. Um, comments from commissioners? No. Comment from me? If no, I would... Uh, I do. I have oh, one. Okay. I, I, I kind of want to go. I want to go back to the noise ordinance, and I want to mention that since the introduction of the ordinance, with the proposed revisions to the current noise ordinance was introduced in May, many or are all of us. We've been downtown. We've been talking to people. We've walked around taking digital readings at different times in front of different speakers. We've looked at speakers. We've looked at their heights. We've looked to see if they're attached, if they're not attached. And there are a lot of opinions uh, on the revisions as well as the cur current ordinance, really. So therefore, I would like to move that the Board of Commissioners table the ordinance introduced on May 28th, 2024, entitled an Ordinance Repealing and Replacing Chapter 42, Article 4, Noise Ordinance of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah, Kentucky. I'll second that. Okay. Some any discussion? Yeah, yes, I, I think I, I think that uh, I've got some just, just a little bit of discussion. I have no absolutely no problem with tabling this issue. I have no problem with that. However, my concern is that we are going to table this indefinitely, and it kind of disappears, and we don't seem to help the residents or uh, the business owners. And so I'm I'm in favor of doing this. If we can say that we'll come back in 60 days or so, and that gives us opportunity, more opportunity to, to read, to study, to try to understand what we're doing, and I think that we're all intelligent folk, and I think that we can come up with something that's going to be a win-win <clears throat> for the residents that live downtown as well as the business owners. And so I'm for it as long as we're going to make a commitment to come back to it in 60 days and make a decision. We can't fix what we don't face, you know, so we got to face it and we got to make a decision and it has to be a win-win for everybody. That's, that's where I am. I just, uh, I'm not for uh, tabling it. I think that we have 
spent a lot of time and money. We've talked to a lot of experts. We've had a lot of legal work on it. And I think that we've got something that is enforceable. And I think that's important. And I don't think that, I don't think from the public's perspective, I don't think there can be a win-win because, you know, there's, it's just impossible because you've got the merchants want it louder, you've got people that live there want it quieter, and some merchants too want it quieter. So I just, it's a difficult decision. I think that you kind of have to split the baby and I think that the ordinance as proposed did that. And I'm not saying we'll make people happy even when we vote on that. But uh, I think we've done enough research and and spend enough time on it. I think it's, I think that I've got enough where I'm comfortable voting on. It. Well, I, I don't have the, enough. I'm, good. I'm sorry. So I don't have enough information to where I'm absolutely comfortable. I don't, I know that we're not going to have perhaps a win win, but I think that we can come to a compromise. And right now, if we take it off the table, then that means. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose, and we're back to where we were, and it's just a matter of time before we come back and you know, dealing with the same thing. So why not just, if you're going to table it, let's table it, and, and during that period, we're doing what we have to do to understand it and to make sure that as close as we can, that people are happy as much as we can. Yeah, my big issue is that we have an ordinance that's, you know, proven to be, you know, the county attorney has said that uh, it, it's not enforceable. And so I, I that's that's really the big. I don't think I he think, said that. I, think, I, don't, I don't, don't think, think he, he said did. that. Yeah. What he said is he could not enforce anything on the 30 hours of footage that he had. He didn't have anything he could. He didn't say you, he couldn't enforce the ordinance. Mm, I don't. Well, we can. <clears throat> I was there in lots of discussions, and it's been made very clear to me, you know, that the current ordinance, you know, is would be an issue. So, I mean, I, I, I think, think there needs to be some changes. I, I you know, I've, and specifically the fifty foot, the fifty foot, uh, the burbage around that is is the issue. There are a lot of changes that would have to be done to the one that was introduced yes. on May. And, and everything's I, a moving target. Right? I don't think we're to that point, and that, that's the reason why I feel like we should table it for now. We can bring it back. So if something is tabled, it can be brought back at sure. any time. Yeah. And therefore, I mean, I guess the challenge is all on us to decide. I don't think we're in agreement should the speak, where the speakers should be located. Should they be attached? What the decibel level is. When we walked around... <clears throat> There was question with us on if the decibel reading, the new one, was too loud or not not loud enough to allow for some music to be played downtown. So I don't think we're any, I just don't think we're there, and I feel like we should just table it for now. Those, that certain ordinance that was introduced on May. With, with your motion, uh, would it be in order that you give us a time limit? Mm -hmm. how, how soon we can come back to it or how soon we should come back to it? Because there's always the... This, this, it'll, it'll be six months from now, and we're still dealing with the same thing. I think you can bring it back at any time. Well, and what, I guess what I'm asking a, a you specifically. I, I'm not okay. going to include that, because I don't know when we'll be ready. Okay. But I think it can be brought back up mm -hmm. at any time. We have a motion uh, and a second. And... So I would like to ask the city clerk to call roll. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? No. Commissioner Smith? No. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Motion to table passes. <clears throat> so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So I moved. Second. Can I ask you a question? Call roll, please. Commissioner Guess? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. I think you should. I think you can. Mean, we just have to listen to the music now. We're not, you're not no. going to enforce the noise on any noise on the I, I, I